Our uh, final speaker is uh, Susan Wachter. Susan is the Richard Worley Professor of Financial Management and Professor of Real Estate and Finance at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Susan also served as the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a President-appointed and Senate-confirmed position. Susan is the author of 150 publications. She has also served as President of the American Real Estate and the Urban Economics Association. She currently serves on multiple editorial boards and is the director of Wharton's GIS Lab and co-director of, of the Penn Institute for Urban Research. She's also the co-chair of the Subprime Crisis Research Council, a bipartisan organization whose purpose is to review, discuss, and make recommendations regarding legislation concerning the subprime mortgage and overall financial sector. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wachter. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, and it's a pleasure to uh, follow the distinguished speakers of the day. I'm sorry I was not able to hear uh, except the end of uh, Professor Alan Blinder's discussion. And in some ways, uh, my talk would logically go first, but I'm going to uh, point to uh, the opportunity of it coming last. Understanding the sources of the ongoing financial upheaval uh, might have come before a talk, for example, of Mark Zandi. Uh, on, uh, I assume you took some of where we are now, and also some of the solutions that we heard from Professor Alan Blinder. But uh, I think understanding the sources will also help put into perspective our alternatives and options for solutions and for understanding where we are actually today. Well, it may seem like we've been in this uh, forever, and the sources of this I'm going to point to have gone back for more than five years. Uh, but it's really reached the public's attention uh, since a little less than a year ago. March 2007, with the sinking housing market. January 2008, with the storms coming. And most recently, September 2008, with what is really a maelstrom of destruction. And indeed, that's where we are, and we are still in that maelstrom of destruction. And note where it's coming from. It's coming from the housing market and the housing market in the United States. This is a global financial crisis made in the USA and triggered by actual and prospective losses in US mortgages. Now, really, the important question is, was it unavoidable? Is it unavoidable is, in, is the key because that will point to what we need to do to prevent going forward a similar or worse crisis and also how we respond now because we under, to understand the causes is to understand potential solutions. Now, everyone knows that this is part of a boom-bust housing price cycle, a boom-bust housing price cycle uh, which is um, beyond anyone's imagination looking at the U.S. economy historically. But the question is, why the boom-bust housing price cycle? The second stylized fact that is well understood, uh, but the linkages are less well understood, is that there has been in the US an historic easing of mortgage lending standards, followed by an historic tightening. And this series of historic changes, first an erosion of mortgage lending credit, followed by this uh, extraordinary credit crisis resulted first, as the lending was um, extended beyond reasonable limits, in housing prices increasing beyond sustain sustainable heights. Basically, basically, the crisis could be summed up in a few words. Loans were made that could not be paid. The result of these this historic extension of credit was a price rise that we hadn't seen anything like previous. In fact, 
Historically, if we've seen this Case-Shiller index, which, which Case-Shiller have extended back for 100 years, what's astounding about it is until 2000, there was a flat curve. Let me repeat that. Housing prices in the U.S. Had, did basically kept pace with inflation for a constant quality home. Same size, same quality, and there are indexes that measure this. Not precisely, but more or less. These measurements of constant quality housing price going as far back as we can, of course the data gets worse farther back, but tell the same story of a housing market where prices keep pace with inflation historically, generally in the U.S., but no more. Something changed. A paradigm shift occurred in the U.S. starting in 2000 and led to price rises, which were not simply steady, minor, or whatever, price rises that almost doubled from an index of 100 in 2000 to almost 200. So a doubling of house prices by the height, 100% gain by the height in 2006. Now, of course, I'm speaking of the United States as though it's one market, and it's anything but one market. And we will see, uh, I will show you some maps of how this played out. And how it played out is very much a part of the story of causation and understanding the sources. Now, Here's, of course, the point of great interest. We are declining now. We've already declined about 20%. How much more? Are we halfway through the decline? Are we going to go back to these numbers that are historic numbers of no price rises whatsoever? Uh, Chip Case, Bob Schiller, who are uh, dear friends of mine, would argue yes. Now, I'm pretty pessimistic as you will see. But I am not that pessimistic, and you will see why. But nonetheless, it is a departure, even if we go back to 2003 prices. And I'm going to argue there are reasons why 2003 are fundamental price levels, as opposed to 2000 make a big difference. Because if you look at 2003 and look at where we are now, that's a 5 to 10 percent difference from where we are now. So we are not too far off in nominal terms from fundamental price levels. Now you might think, therefore, I'm, a pes I'm an optimist or, or fine, we're almost there. The real source of our problem going forward is not only that our fundamentals are, let's say, 5-10% below where we are now, but that we are very likely to blow out on the downside as we blowed out on the upside. Very likely to overcorrect going down as we absolutely went far beyond fundamentals on the upside. And I will show you why I believe so. First, made in the USA. Now, this is a chart where you see lines all moving together, hard to read them, and it looks like everything is marching more or less the same. Um, so that's in part the point. Uh, this is price appreciation controlled for volatility, and I'll tell you why I control it for volatility. But uh, the uh, paper is available uh, online, it's, all, it's in Wharton Real Estate Review, it just came out uh, uh, actually a few days ago. Uh, the paper, trace, this, this chart and other charts there, trace U.S. home prices compared with eight, or including U.S., eight, these are eight uh, lines. So, uh, and it looks sort of very, still volatile, but relatively flat from 1990, uh, and it starts from 1990 and goes all the way through 2008. Uh, we are on the top. Our line is the topmost line. I don't have a pointer, but it is the topmost line. It's the dark line uh, that's uh, blue-black, and it's the topmost. Um, now, the re if actually you saw instead price appreciation not controlled for volatility, we would be right in the middle of the pack not on the top. But actually, we were less volatile. Until recently, we were the least volatile of our major trading partners. And we can do this for 24 nations. It wouldn't matter. I'd have that as well. Something happened starting in 2003. You, have, you see 2002, you see 2004. Somewhere in between there in 2003, we departed from the pack. And pretty significantly, that's from, it's going from one to uh, one um, uh, from 
from a level of 1 to a level of almost 1.5. That's a pretty significant increase. And then that held until 2006. So from 2003 to 2006, we departed from the pack, and then from 2006 on, we have uh, embarked on this incredible decline. Now, it is true that some of our uh, peer nations here, the UK, is in fact falling apart as we speak, uh, as is, um, well, actually none of the other countries listed here. Canada, for example, uh, our northern uh, border has not been impacted at all. Why these differences? We can take that up somewhat in terms of different countries. My focus is going to be on U.S. versus all other countries, because it clearly is a made in the US, USA phenomenon. Why? We had decades of securitization in this country. In fact, securitization rescued us from the savings and loan crisis in 1990. And in fact, securitization was part of getting us out of the Great Depression. Fannie Mae was put into place at that point. So it's not securitization itself. That's not the problem. Now, interest rate risk, apologize, typo. Interest rate risk was the risk that was securitized historically. So in the securitization of mortgages, we essentially securitized interest rate risk not credit risk. Now, what do I mean by that? What were our securities of mortgages prior to 2000 or so? Prior to 2000 or so, our securities were Ginnie Mae securities, Fannie Mae securities, and Freddie Mac securities. Now, if you were investors purchasing any of these securities, you were exposed to interest rate risk, but you were not 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 exposed to default risk. What if the mortgages went into default? What then? The US government stood entirely explicitly behind Ginny May. And in fact, Ginny May year to year has never been a drain. Unfortunately, I believe will be Ginny May and FHA, Ginny May backs FHA have never been a drain to the U.S. Treasury. They, in fact, have been a contributor to the U.S. Treasury, to us taxpayers. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac have also implicitly and now explicitly default risks have been backed by the federal government. In fact, it was the ambiguity of that backing because although people assume so, it was implicitly traded over government desks, desks and it traded very close to U.S. Treasuries within a range of 25 to 50 basis points with U.S. trade over the same desk, same risk, with same maturity. But something happened in the beginning of this crisis, which we will return to, which helped precipitate the change in Fannie and Freddie. We'll come back to that. But in any case, interest rate risk was, investors were exposed to interest rate risk. These securities were sliced and diced. You had IO strips, principal strips. People, in fact, uh, wanted hedged risk on both sides. But these were extraordinarily liquid instruments, extraordinarily standardized. The only non-standardized part of it was a self-risk question of do you want to be exposed to interest rate? How long do you want to be? How short do you want to be? Now, somewhere in the period of around 2000, and really taking off, as you'll see in one moment, in 2003, we shifted to an altogether new, words like innovation, transformative, but I would rather use words like um, metatasize, some words of uh, real concern, a totally different securitization market, which took over the markets. By the time it was over, it was almost 50% of the markets were being taken over by these new instruments. Private label securitization, Wall Street securitization, packaging mortgages, yes, just like Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny, packaging mortgages, yes, but packaging them by Wall Street and then not trading them. These were not standardized, not homogeneous. They were, could not be marked to market for just of the, I was fortunate to hear a few of the comments of uh, Professor Alan Blinder. They could not be traded. They were very heterogeneous. They were 
very idiosyncratic, which meant what was the price? One didn't know. They were marked to model and not marked to market. The riskiest piece of them was supposedly the toxic debt. They're all toxic, as it turned out. How did that happen? How did Wall Street go so wrong? We will see in a moment. But part of this switch was accompanied by the huge expansion of credit. Not only expansion on the part of mortgages, but more broadly, as we'll see in a moment. So government debt in this period, starting in 1975, going far back, did not increase in the period 1990, uh, from 1975, but particularly from 2000 to 2005, or even 1990, 1995 to 2005, government debt decreased. Also, non-financial companies' debt held steady, did not increase. Household debt expanded at historical rates we have never seen before, backed by more mortgage debt. Consumer credit debt expanded, but particularly consumer credit debt was consolidated, and we started lending against our homes. At the same time, financial companies' debt expanded even more because there were not only these mortgage-backed securities that were created backed by mortgage debt, we also created a parallel artificial synthetic mortgage-backed securities that were backed by nothing. How is that possible? You'll see that in a moment. Okay, first let's look, let's look at the products that enabled, enablers that enabled this historic expansion. So starting in uh, 2000, uh, we had very little of these products. What are these products? Non-traditional mortgage lending products. Prior to 2000, most of the products, there was a small uh, subprime, non-prime, but it really didn't take off. Uh, and it didn't exist prior to 1995 at all. So December 01, we had basically very little, only about 10 billion. That top line tells us our non-prime, basically subprime mortgages. So the top line says we started with 10 billion, we ended with 70 or so billion. But the composition is even more interesting by December 05. Of course, in December, in the year 06, and even 07, we expanded, we doubled this. But the composition is very interesting. Starting in, uh, by, in December 01, we had almost no interest only. By the end, more than half of the non-traditional, non-prime, what is non-prime? Non-prime, subprime means it's being lent to borrowers who are risky. So these are risky borrowers with FICO scores under 650 or so, risky borrowers who now are being given mortgages. By the way, risky mortgages were out there, but they tended to be very loan to value, very low loan to value, and of course there are all sorts of others. You would never lend an interest only, which is basically a non-amortizing loan. And then we went even more to option arms. Option arms is not non-amortizing mortgages, it's negatively amortizing mortgages. That is, the mortgages went further into debt the initial years. And it's actually the option arms that are the most concerned, and part of the reason why I'm not as optimistic as Professor Blinder, because there's a problem ahead of us. Those problems are not, as you'll see, are just hitting us now, and a problem that'll be with us for several years. Okay, now let's look at it, um, what increased and what decreased starting in 2003. FHA VA, which was 8% um, of the market, halved to, to three, went to 3% of the market. Now it's, of course, uh, and also uh, conventional conforming. Conforming is another way of saying Fannie Freddie. FHA is Jimmy May, by the way. Uh, Fannie Freddie went from 57% from of the market, only 60%. It halved to about 33% of the market. So Fannie Freddie halved. Um, FHA VA more than half, and of course today, these numbers are now in 2008, they are the market. They are 90% of the market. Jumbo, even Jumbo, uh, which trade very closely, Fannie Freddie, uh, uh, decreased. It was subprime that increased from 7% to 20% threefold. Alt-A that increased from 2% to 13%. Alt-A didn't exist, HELOCs, which are piggybacks. But the important thing was that we layered all of these together. So we gave a subprime and an alt-a loan 
plus a piggyback loan, wiping out any down payment. Now, what's an Alt-A? Alt-A existed prior to 2000. It was given to a niche. It was a niche product for self-employed people who did not have the traditional uh, corporate kind of incomes to be verified. Alt-A uh, is, quote, unquote, stated income or you state your own income, now commonly known as liar loans. State whatever income you'd like. Or ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets. No anything. Within these, within these loans, there is a deterioration of standards. So these slides will be available, so you'll be able to look at them. But I'll just uh, point out a few uh, points. Uh, within these loans, so uh, within, for example, subprime, subprime um, uh, uh, adjustable rate mortgages. And by the way, the subprime uh, mortgages, which I haven't shown you, there's other slides to point to this, uh, which normally were fixed rate mortgages became adjustable rate mortgages, and which were the, and not just adjustable rate mortgages, but teaser rate loans. So these teaser rate loans then were made with folks with consolidated loan to value, which went from very low CLTV to very high. And where um, uh, the um, uh, uh, seconds almost didn't exist, uh, began to be a, a very large percentage were seconds. So we layered and layered and layered. And while full documentation was very rare in the beginning part of this period, 1%, it became a large percentage as well. Now, there's one more point on this slide which I want to get to. But before I get there, I want to tell you about teaser rate loans. Because teaser rate loans are really the paradigm. Option arms are similar to teaser rates in this mechanism. Why would anyone take a loan that could not be repaid? So why would a borrower take a loan today at maybe 6%, which is going to become 12%, 2 or 3 a teaser rate loan? Decimal rate, subprime, teaser rate loan. Was, and a subprime, it was a risky borrower. Why would they do that? They were told by brokers, and the brokers community told themselves, and Wall Street told, them, told the same story, which is, look, prices have been going up historically since 2000. They're not going to not go up. And if you keep paying your subprime low rate for two or three years, your credit will heal, and then you can refinance into a fixed rate mortgage at that same 5 6% rate. You cannot lose. So the ability to refinance was key to these loans, which is absolutely identical to the problem that got us into the Great Depression. The Great Depression, we had bullet loans, which came due and had to be repaid, but there was no financing. But it was assumed that the financing would be always there. So these loans came due. Now, these loans started to be made in 2003, 2004. They came due two or three years later with the expectation that they could be refinanced because prices were going up. And if prices were going up, whether your credit was good or not, you could either refinance or you could sell into the market. So you would not default. You might have to move from your home, but you would not go into foreclosure. You'd go to, you would not pay your payment. You would default to that extent. But you would extract the equity because you would sell your home. You would not go into foreclosure. So in fact, through the second half of 2006, foreclosure rates did not increase. And even default rates didn't increase because people who couldn't pay would simply not default. They wouldn't hurt their, their credit rate. They would sell their homes into this rising market. So what happened to change that? First of all, the number of subprime loans were made in particular places in the United States. And notice uh, Texas, and I'm going to come back to that because that's kind of an anomaly. We'll come back to the reason why. But have a mental image of this, which is basically the coast moving in. And where the subprime loans are, that's exactly where house prices increase. We have regression analysis that backs this up. And that's exactly where prices are declining. The red air, we have county by county data, which points to this. Uh, in, in, a, in a formal model. But in any case, these are the areas where prices are the red. Prices have already fallen more than 20 percent. The orange, between, between 10 and 20, et cetera. And there are parts of the U.S. where there is no correction, including Texas, where we have subprime lending anyway. 
So that is a puzzle, but it's actually not a puzzle. Because there are two paradigm shifts that were going on at the same time in the U.S. since 2000. Point one was, yes, this growth of subprime, risky loans backed by Wall Street. Two is, in the U.S., as I told, as I discussed earlier, as I pointed to earlier, housing prices pretty much kept pace with inflation no more, on average throughout the U.S. Why was that? Well, the U.S. was blessed with a housing market that economists call elastic very responsive. The demand goes up, the supply goes up, and if supply responds to demand, housing prices do not go up. And that was the U.S., except for some places like California, which have been in a regulatory environment that's pretty stringent for decades. California, Boston, and there are some other parts of the U.S. have seen these cycles up and down, back and forth, but not Texas and not big swaths of the U.S. But what happened starting in 2000 is this regulatory environment responding to environmental concerns made housing more inelastically supplied. What's important about that? We are in a new world. We're much more like Europe now, where housing supply is much less elastic, which means we will be subject to volatile housing prices like those of Los Angeles, like those of Boston, much more pervasively. Still, parts of the country will have flat prices because supply is pretty elastic. Even though demand increased tremendously in Texas, prices did not go up in this period because supply responded. And therefore, they didn't have the bubble, and therefore, they didn't have the collapse but not true for much of the U.S. And in these areas where the bubble's collapsing, it has now morphed to the overall economy and the overall economy in these areas. So we are absolutely in a recession in the U.S., but the recession is far worse where the housing recession is as well. And there are some growing areas. How did we get here? Well, here is the circle that kind of takes us around to, to how we have come out in this very difficult spot. Borrowers, as I mentioned, borrowed at teaser rates. They were not able or expected to repay at reset. These were originated by brokers in the new model, originate to distribute as opposed to originate to hold. So, lend to banks were not on, uh, had no risk in these loans. The secondary market took these, packaged them in securities, again, took no risk and packaged the securities. They were then rated by our regulators with rating agencies, in a sense, are the regulators of our market. They're the only ones out there. They're, in fact, licensed by the federal government. It's an uh, uh, oligopoly. And the agency incentives, the rating agencies, of course, were uh, misaligned as all through, as I will come back to in a moment. But they, of course, were incentivized to approve, give the triple A imprimatur. Now, on what argument could they possibly give a triple A imprimatur? On two arguments. Argument one, they were diversified. The MBS was diversified. Argument two, housing prices never fall, which, of course, at the time was simply unbelievable. Because after all, we live in the world, and housing prices go up and down throughout the world. And certainly by 2005, 2006, there were many of us saying, what model are you looking at, Moody's and Standards and Poor's? And the fact is they weren't looking at housing price models. The key factor to whether loans default and go into foreclosure is loan to value. If the loan exceeds the value of the home, that means you cannot sell it into the market and get your mortgage out. Your only option is to walk if you can't make the payment. And of course, they can't make the payments. So the value was exceedingly important to know what that value would be. But they were not looking at, more at models of value. Come back to that point in a moment. Now, the key point on this was that the regulators didn't own these mortgages. They sold them out to investors. And investors, after all, did own these mortgages. So in this circle, someone, in fact, owned the mortgages in the end, and therefore, in theory, the risk of the mortgages, the investors. And while this was happening, I was extraordinarily puzzled because uh, we did point to this uh, obvious bubble in 2005, 2006, 2000. Who was buying? Why were the investors buying these highly risky mortgages? Puzzled. I was really puzzled. And I didn't see the answer until recently. I did not see the answer until this fall as to why the investors were buying the, the mortgages. 
an instrument which really took off and in its dimensions in a totally unregulated way. I'd, I'd say the most important instrument not to be regulated in, since in the last decades is CDS, which is credit default swaps. Credit default swaps is a way of insuring against risk, all sorts of risk, but particularly the risk of default of these residential mortgage-backed securities that were packaged by the secondary market with a toxic, yes, but they're all toxic, triple A imprimatur, but nonetheless, they were clearly risky. And the investors, in theory, owned these, were exposed to the risk. And indeed, some of the same securitizers who were packaging these did, in fact, have to own them. Why were they and how were they? Well, let's, before we thoroughly answer that question, what's making this circle go round? At every level, there were huge short-run profits, fees for moving the product. The originators were making very large fees, much larger than the prime, the typical prime mortgage origination fee. The secondary market and packaging, selling these uh, very arcane instruments at prices which, as we see, were not traded, so we don't know, so they were, but they were very profitable. The regulators were making uh, profits as well. The investors were holding these. Sometimes the investors were, in fact, the Wall Street firms that were securitizing them. But if they were, they were also holding credit default swaps that were issued to protect them, insurance to protect against default. Who was issuing credit default swaps? They were issued by very large insurance firms, in particular AIG. AIG was given the right to issue credit default swaps more than the right. There was legislation passed that precluded states from requiring reserves against these credit default swaps. So normally, insurance companies are regulated by states, and the states indeed require reserves. But in this case, Congress passed legislation which precluded states from requiring the issuers of these mortgages, as long as they were AAA, from reserving. And therefore, these credit default swaps were extremely cheap. How cheap? Let's go back for a moment. 2000. December 2000. Now, again, you can't see these numbers, but we have this spread, the risk premium on these mortgages. The risk premium on these mortgages did not increase over time. In fact, they decreased it over time. So as these mortgages became more and more risky, they did not trade at a higher risk premium, in part because of the credit default swaps that were being issued behind them, which made it appear as though these were not risky. Now, they were, they were clearly counterparty risk. So why weren't the investment banks thinking about the counterparty risk of the issuers of the credit default swaps? Well, if I were a Wall Street banker and I was thinking about AIG issuing this, I would say if AIG fails, everything fails. It's too big to fail. Indeed, they were right. So where does the buck stop in the too big to fail the taxpayer stepping in today. So where are we now? What about Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac? Well, they're part of the story. They too, they too added to the risk, no doubt about it. But they did not add to the risk through 2005. So through 2005, their uh, portion, and you can see their portion. Uh, Freddie Mac is that top dotted line. Fannie Mae is the solid. I'm sorry, that's Fannie Mae. The second solid line is Freddie Mac. They're decreasing their market share through 2005. They held to their standards. They did not, uh, did not uh, engage in lending to these risky borrowers until 2005. But uh, we now understand in 2006 they did, in 2007, and GAO, GAO is investigating that more. Uh, FHA's share declined and, uh, of course, subprime increased. Why then? In sum, I'll come back to this, there is risk taking without accountability. And in that situation, when you have competition for market share and for fees, underpriced risk is inevitable. Now, how do we get out? The economic downturn could be severe, as you've heard, 
And of course, we now have a credit crunch to end all credit crunches and an adverse feedback loop where housing markets are leading to recession and recession is making uh, the housing market prices fall further. Is there a bottom? Now here is my, um, that is, are we 10% away? Well, I would argue no, we're likely to overcorrect quickly. In normal circumstances, when price, when supply is greater than demand, we have a gap, supply is greater than demand, we have that. Prices fall and they clear because demand decreases and supply, I'm sorry, supply decreases and demand increases. So we see here demand decreasing and supply, demand increasing and supply decreasing. But we're not in normal circumstances. Current circumstances, actually, as prices fall, supply increases. So it destabilizes the market. So we have a downward spiral in the housing market, which then contributes to the overall economy weakening, which contributes to further worsening of the housing market. So, so far, the reason we have these large foreclosures and defaults is not coming out of the recession, because we just began the recession. It's coming out of these payment shocks from resets and option arms. But going forward, we're likely to see this payment difficulty coming out of recession at the same time as more foreclosures come into the market, driving prices down, more homes where people cannot make the payments, they also cannot sell into the market, bringing more properties into foreclosure. Let's see how that looks. We had a moment in 2007 where, in fact, the inventory, and it all has to supply, is all the question of inventory, it's all it's about, is what's the inventory out there? Actually, the inventory decreased, good thing. We see in 2007 it decreased. And that's because, just as in normal, construction starts stopped. As housing prices fell, construction stopped, just as you would expect. But then we started having the ramp up from the supply coming from foreclosures. And the problem is homeowner vacancy, which is at historic rates, 3% of the stock and going up. And here is the wave of foreclosure which is coming at us. And in fact, the, uh, the problem to come is Alt-A. Alt-A is the inventory is rising to the subprime shock, but the Alt, this, this is when these bonds were issued. So you can see that the height of the subprime was 2005, 2006. But actually, the height of the Alt-A was 2007. So the Alt-A, which are often these option arms, two, three years out, they will continue to be a problem for us. They are uh, recasting, the word for them is recasting as we speak, but they will be recasting through 2012. So, of course, we have our credit crunch. Why $700 billion? Well, because there was an estimate at the time of a trillion dollar loss. You heard from Mark Zandi, that was part of his numbers. Uh, there certainly the numbers are larger today. Uh, there's only 500 billion recognized, so 1.2 trillion minus 500 gives you about 700. There's the, the loss. i um, end up here with perspectives going forward, and then in questions, I'd be glad to take what might be um, what, what we do in the short run. But in the long run, as um, Ben Bernanke has said, the events of the past year or two have highlighted regulatory gaps and deficiencies that we must address. As we recover from the current crisis, we have to address these issues with a regulatory structure that will better respond to future economic challenges. But in order to do that, we must get out of the current crisis. As Paulson has said, the federal government must implement a program to remove these illiquid assets. The problem is we're not doing that. Thank you very much. Questions, please. I know it's late, but we got a question over there on the left, two over there on the left. Uh, one of the consequences of the housing problem is uh, we are essentially disqualifying borrowers from being credit worthy in the future. So as we think about coming out of the recession, two, three, four quarters from now. We're willing to lend to these people because virtually what's happened to them in the housing where they, you know, were borrowing for their house. They're no longer eligible. And they're no longer eligible, why? Well, because their credit scores are terrible. Exactly. Because they were 
other mortgages. So I'm not exactly sure where you're, but your question is that the borrowers today cannot qualify. They cannot qualify because they're going into recession, so their income will be in question. No, they, they've already default. They will have defaulted they've on their defaulted. Notes, all right. Their credit score will be terrible. Exactly. And the banks won't be willing to lend to them. Right. So then it almost begs for a government solution on the lending side. Right. So the key point that, has, that the questioner points to is FICO scores, in fact, are now going up so much that even uh, borrowers don't qualify for FHA, which is part of the reason why the FHA solution isn't working, because the borrowers are default, their FICO scores are, are make them basically not able to qualify for these loans. Uh, which uh, means that what we will have to do, we haven't addressed this part of the problem. And part of the addressing of this part of the problem will have to be for the short run that if you are paying your mortgage, your FICO score doesn't matter. If you're in your home and you're paying your mortgage, the FICO score doesn't matter. What are some of the reasons for which um, the, there, was a, there are so many more subprime loans in, for example, California and Florida compared to other states, and especially since that's obviously such an important right. factor as so to why a, it started? It's a very good question. These were, the, these were the markets where housing was unaffordable, in part because regulation is um, much uh, tighter there, and also simply the density of these markets combined. The, the demand was high, and the regulatory structure uh, meant that these prices were very high. So it was a basic housing market problem of tremendous demand in California, tremendous demand in Florida, but the supply didn't respond. Therefore, housing prices were high. Therefore, these markets were not affordable. Therefore, to get loans out in these markets, the brokers, et cetera, pushed for the non-affordable products, which would allow people to, excuse me, the aggressive products, the affordable products, which would allow people to get into the homes. What made these products affordable it meant that you cut interest rate today in half of what it would be, it meant that, in fact, maybe you didn't have to pay your principal back for years, or even you could borrow more on your principal. So all of this would make the mortgage affordable. Unfortunately, all of this also made the mortgage risky. How much did the tremendous, the loose credit and the amount of money that was pushed into the market, particularly after 9-11, uh, contribute to this? Right. And, and the other, the uh, corresponding question, the changes in the amount of leverage that the capital decisions that were made there. Um, absolutely, the change in the leverage was a key to this. It was, in fact, what caused the investment banks to go under. So again, there was a deregulation done, and this was done in 2004, which allowed the investment banks to go from a, a, a leverage ratio of 1 to 12 to 1 to 40. So that switch basically caused them to go under. So that, yes, the investment banks, at the same time that they were making these loans and taking on the MBS and um, and owning them for their own trading, they're also levering up. And we saw that. And we also saw these synthetic mortgage instruments that they were also putting on their books. What were these synthetic mortgage instruments? Credit default swaps were created on both sides to mirror the underlying movement of the, of the subprime mor mortgage-backed securities. So those two there were. So yes, just tremendous leveraging up. Now the next question, the first question that you ask is, to what extent was this the interest rate decline and the increase in money supply coming out of the, uh, the threat in 2000? I am not a, a macroeconomist, but Robert Hall and other macroeconomists with whom I have spoken, and this is the data I see as well on the housing side, is that's part of it, but not that much of it, uh, contrary to what some people say. And the reason for that, for my saying that, is in looking at it in 2002, people were really worried about deflation. Remember, we're coming out of a recession, and it was a worldwide fear. Now, it is possible that money supply was overexpanded to some degree in response to that, but it was um, interest rates did not go down a lot in 2002. They, in fact, went down after the recession, which is normal, and they stayed low. And, but our interest rates were no lower than the rest of the world. So part of the reason that interest rates were low in 2003 and 2002, 2003, 2004, and they're even still low for treasuries, of course now it's a different world, is because we had a decline in inflation risk worldwide. So the risk premium for inflation actually decreased. So it may have been a part of it, but it was not a large part. Which is, by the way, why I think 2003 is, is in fact, an equilibrium we can go back to because interest rates are not that different from they were in 2003 
federal treasuries. Going back a moment to the supply demand curve and pricing of houses, um, maybe it's just that it's been a long day, but it seems to me the logical conclusion to to rise to raising housing prices is to start bulldozing vacant houses. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is that the kind of thing that we're moving towards? That kind of strategy? There undoubtedly will have to be some of that, absolutely. There are in two ways. One, uh, in urban areas, we're going to have problems of uh, uh, vacancies, abandonment, which of course bring down urban areas, and we will have to do something about that much better than we've done before. Otherwise, we will have these vacant abandoned homes as sources of crime, et cetera. And there are much of the lending, however, wasn't done in cities. Actually, cities in some cases are holding up better than the far-flung suburbs. It's the drive to qualify suburbs where these subprime loans were made. And we're talking Riverside, Inland Empire, whole subdivisions where 45, 50% of the homes are in foreclosure. Just uh, to, pay, to piggyback on that circle that, sh that you had put together, uh, there was an article in the New York Times on Sunday that talked about Yes. In essence, there is this whole banking organization who packed up their bags millions of dollars and bye bye. So uh, going forward, obviously, there will have to be a non-fee-based system and discussion of how we get there is, is ongoing right now. It's going on right now. Uh, the question of, it's a very tricky question of, uh, certainly, uh, there are folks like the Attorney General in New York who are saying ill-gotten gains. Well, we've taken you over. The party's over. Yes. You indicated that uh, the, the, uh, regarding the oversupply of housing and, and pricing, that you anticipate an overcorrection. Uh, this, mor this morning, Dr. Bliner indicated that we really haven't addressed uh, mortgages. Do you have any recommendations for uh, both from the Fed and the Treasury what steps might be taken to, to soften that overcorrection? Right, and to me that's the most important question of the next month. And there are uh, actually several proposals out there, the four or five proposals out there. None of them are easy. Uh, it's going to take uh, intent, discussion, and uh, either in this uh, Congress or the next Congress we'll have to have legislation to make it happen. There are reasons why uh, you couldn't simply go using the TARP and buy these mortgages and have it as a solution. The reason is that these securities were meant to be brainless, that there is no one who actually has it in their incentive to <coughs> maximize the value of the and, the and limit the risk, minimize the long run risk. It's incentive to take the fees, but no incentive to minimize the long run risk. Normally, a securities, the trustee and the servicer of the securities should be incentivized to maximize the net present value of the security. That is the case with commercial mortgage-backed securities. But these securities were so structured that the servicer has a contract just to get servicing fees, period. And also, if there's foreclosure, to get the recovery for foreclosure. They are not incentivized, nor can they, in fact, even get funding if they increase their efforts to attempt to work with borrowers. So that's the first problem which has to be solved. And there are three or four technical solutions. Uh, one place to go for uh, discussion, but they will require acts of Congress, is the Center for American Progress. Um, I've been working with them, and they have on their website uh, some of the uh, legislative solutions that are currently being considered. If there's no other burning questions, 
Let's uh, thank Dr. Washington. <laughs>